So here we are on Friday, and um, it's been a tough week. Tough week for the defense, tough week for Derek Chauvin. We're in the prosecution's case, and we know there's some really, really bad evidence that the defense has to deal with. And, and you know, the video is absolutely uh, horrible. The 9 minutes and 29 seconds is, is horrendous. But what happened today may be the most devastating. Let me explain. Um, I think a lot of you have heard of the, the um, concept of the blue wall of silence, that police officers uh, protect one another. They're, they're in a brotherhood, a sisterhood, and, and you know, they, 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 they're the only ones who understand the job that they do, and they often have each other's back. That's part of being an officer. Now, whether or not that blue wall of silence actually exists or not, that's not what we're debating tonight. But the perception of that blue wall of silence does exist. People absolutely believe that police officers will do just about anything to protect another police officer. So when a police officer testifies against another officer and they're from the same department, that is bad. That is powerful for the prosecution. That is devastating for the defense. That's what happened. It's my biggest moment of the day. Did you watch that video in its entirety? Yes, I did. And since then, have you had an opportunity to watch other video of the incident? Yes. And specifically, have you watched uh, body-worn camera video of the incident from the involved officers? Yes. And based on that uh, and your years of training and experience with the Minneapolis Police Department, um, you saw Officer, then Officer Chauvin, with his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck, correct? Yes. Would you call what you saw there a use of force? Yes. And did that use of force continue until the ambulance arrived? Yes, it did. Was there any change in the level of force being used until the ambulance arrived? No. And. What do you think about that use of force during that time period? I'm sorry? What do you think about that use of force during that time period? I'm going to object to that phrase of that question. Uh, a little vague. Could you uh, li limit it to uh, the time frame? Right. Okay. So, um, based on your review of the body worn camera videos of the incident, yes. And directing your attention you know, to that moment when Mr. Floyd is placed on the ground, yes. Um, what is your, uh, you know, your view of that use of force during that time period? Totally unnecessary. That's, uh, that's, that's horrific. I mean, there, there's no way around it. Devastating. Devastating. I mean, this is uh, Lieutenant Richard Zimmerman, okay? He's from the Minneapolis Police Department. He's a fellow officer of, of Chauvin's. And he's looking at that and saying, there's, there's no explanation for that. None whatsoever. Let's bring in Court TV uh, legal correspondent Julie Janae, who's joining us tonight from Minneapolis. Uh, Julia, am I, under, am I overselling this, this, this the, the devastation impact uh, that this testimony had today? Lieutenant Richard Zimmerman really came into the courtroom cloaked in authority. I would say he's one of the most authoritative figures on police protocol who's come into the courtroom so far. And these jurors were engaged in the things that he was saying, and they were taking a lot of notes, a lot more than they've been taking, it seems, than previous days, because he got into a lot of the things that are at the heart of this case. He talked about use of force, when it's appropriate, when the prone position is appropriate and how dangerous it can be and why someone needs to be turned over to the side recovery. He's someone who's the number one ranking senior officer in the Minneapolis Police Department. He's been on the force since 1981. So yes, I think his testimony, very powerful and important for these jurors today. Oh, absolutely. Let's take a listen to a little bit more of Lieutenant Zimmerman's uh, testimony today. Well, first of all, uh, pulling him down to the ground face down and putting your knee on the neck for that amount of, uh, that amount of time is just um, 
uncalled for. Um, it, I saw no reason why the officers felt they were in danger, if that's what they felt. Um, and that's what they would have to feel to be able to use that kind of force. So in your opinion, should that restraint have stopped once he was handcuffed and prone on the ground? Absolutely. Okay. And I should add to that question then, also that it appeared he had stopped resisting. I'm sorry? And it appeared that he had stopped putting up any resistance. Absolutely, I would stop. I have nothing further, Gar. All right, Julie, d does he have any relation? Did he know Chauvin before this? I know it's a, it's a big force. I, I don't know if everyone knows each other. Did they talk at all about his relationship or what he knew about Chauvin before this? He did know of Chauvin. They're all in the same um, same police force. And he actually said some things directly about Derek Chauvin after this was this became public back in 2020. Uh, but as far as his role there in the Minneapolis Police Department, he responds to critical incidents. So he's the one who comes out and reviews use of force, how it was used, whether or not it was appropriate. So even though he's not one of the paid experts who's going to come in and talk about use of force, he is the one who is always investigating these use of force incidents for the Minneapolis Police Department. All right. Uh, you mentioned 2020. Back in June of 2020, there was an open letter from some Minneapolis uh, police officers. Uh, was Zimmerman part of that? Zimmerman was. This was on June 11th of 2020, just a few days after the death of George Floyd. 14 Minneapolis police officers penned a open letter to the public saying that we uh, wholeheartedly condemn Derek Chauvin. We are with you in the denouncement of Derek Chauvin's actions on Memorial Day 2020. Like us, Derek Chauvin took an oath to hold up the sanctity of life most precious. Derek Chauvin failed as a human and stripped George Floyd of his dignity and life. This is not who we are. That's part of that letter that was put out for the public didn't come up today during the testimony, but it is something that we were able to find that had to do with um, the t his background as far as what he thought about what happened, even closer to the time of 2020. And, and Zimmerman, is he is he part of what you would call like the brass? Is he is he one of the, the leaders of the, of the police force or is he? more of a rank and file leader. Where exactly does he fall in, in, in everything here? And you said he investigates the use of force. So is he sort of an internal investigator? Well, he's not with a separate department or something that oversees the Minneapolis Police Department. He is with the Minneapolis Police Department. He's an investigator, which is something that came out a lot on Cross, is that he spends most of his time reviewing what the officers do. He's, uh, in the way that he explained his rank, he is the senior officer. Um, he is a lieutenant and he's moved up in the ranks over the decades that he's been there in the force. All right, let's bring uh, our guests into the conversation. Here come the judges. Joining us tonight, Judge Gino Brogdon and retired municipal court judge Lynn Toller. Uh, great to have you both back on the program. Um, all right, uh, Judge Toller, I'll begin with you. Um, let, let, let's start with the numbers. Zero to ten. How devastating do you see uh, the testimony of Lieutenant Zimmerman? I, I, I would put it, it's right up there, nine or ten, and I'll tell you why. Not only because he is from within the department and that he is so experienced, but he was a great witness. He talked to the jury. He would look at them. He obviously has had experience in that box, and he didn't spar with defense counsel or anybody, you know, he was, he, he seemed to be forthright, simple, direct, and I thought he made a very, very powerful witness. Judge Rogan, what do you think? Zero to 10. Well, I, I, I need I a number to, first. I, nine, I'll give it a nine, and let me tell you why. Ordinarily, experts, when they come into a trial, they are in there talking about their opinion as to whether something met a certain standard, they're allowed to give an opinion based on their education, training, and experience. They're different from a lay or fact witness in that way. This particular expert is very special to this trial because he's an insider. He's not like other experts who look at 
records and depositions and things of that sort and then give an opinion. He actually is someone who trained people in this department. He knows Chauvin. He knows how this is supposed to be done. And what jurors ask is how much is too much? That's where an expert comes in and says, based on my training, experience, and uh, my perspective, this is too much. When that testimony comes from a fellow officer, one, it's not only really rare, but it's incredibly impactful. This was powerful. Absolutely, because you know when we think of experts, we know, and it usually comes out uh, during direct and cross, that they are paid experts. They get paid for their time. Everyone's entitled to eat, by the way. But um, this is a different type of expert. You're so right, Judge. All right, let's take a listen to a little bit of the cross-examination of Lieutenant Zimmerman. You have never been trained as a Minneapolis police officer to use a knee on the neck of a suspect. That's correct. You would agree, however, that in a fight for your life, generally speaking, uh, in a fight for your life, you as an officer are allowed to use whatever force is reasonable and necessary, correct? Yes. And that can even involve improvisation, agreed? Uh, yes. Minneapolis Police Department policy allows a police officer to use whatever means are, ne are available to him to protect himself and others, right? Yes. So if there's a paint can sitting on the table and someone is attacking, you can use that paint can as a weapon. Yes. And in fact, uh, you have been trained in the prone handcuffing techniques, correct? Yes. And it's your testimony that Minneapolis Police Department has never, ever trained anyone to put their knee across the shoulder and to the base of the neck? I didn't say that. Okay. So w you would agree then that pursuant to Minneapolis Police Department training, when a suspect is arrested and, and in the process of being handcuffed or being restrained, it would be consistent with the Minneapolis Police Department training you've received to place your knee across the shoulder to the base of the neck? Um, I, I don't know if I've, uh, part of your question was handcuffing, and we've certainly been trained to put the knee on the shoulder, but I don't know about just restraining a person. I, I don't recall being trained in that. All right, Julia Janae, do we know what the training is that Chauvin received? It's hard to give a definitive answer on that because it depends which training manual you're looking at, which training video you're looking at. Some of the training videos have a knee on the back. The training manual does talk about a neck, neck restraint, that being a type of restraint that is maximum and could be dangerous, but if you use it, then the side recovery position needs to come after it. But we do know that there is a training manual PowerPoint from training that shows a restraint where two officers are on the abdomen and one has a knee on a suspect's neck or neck area, maybe not directly on the neck. All right, uh, Judge Brogdon, does is, is that give uh, an opening for the defense if the training that Chauvin got is different than the training that Lieutenant Zimmerman got? Uh, sure it does. One of the thrusts of the defense case is that Chauvin was doing his job. That's why they go through kind of painstakingly about how he was trained, how you cuff, how you lay someone down. The power of this uh, scenario is Chauvin was the training officer. So he ought to know better in terms of how much force is too much. The power of this witness, he not only describes how you do it, but he says that the force has to be commensurate with the risk or the threat to you. Notice in his testimony, he said, I didn't see how at this particular point that Mr. Floyd was a threat to the officer. What that means, when the threat ends, so does the knee. Judge Toller, what are your thoughts here about, in general, the knee on the neck? Is it, is it at no point is it appropriate, or is it all about the amount of time? Because what I'm hearing a little bit from Zimmerman is almost like, you don't put a knee on someone's neck. 
Right. I think that there probably could have been two different training uh, uh, positions on that. And, and I think that, as, as the judge said, very, very important. But what I think, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, my God. I'm getting old. <laughs> well, you know what it 61. is? I, I, I may lose my train of thought as well uh, uh, tonight. I, I got, I got the, the shot in the arm, but so I'm a little groggy myself. Yeah. No problem. So the, yeah, the knee on the neck is... He made a point of saying, at every point in time, you are required to reassess the threat. And at no point in time did he reassess the threat. And I know that defense counsel is trying to, to posit that, though the threat from, uh, 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 from um, Floyd may have been uh, dealt with, he was dealing with the other threat. But you have to then go to what happened during that with his hand in his pocket, the conversations that he had during and after that to decide whether or not there was another extreme threat that he had to deal with that allowed him or precluded him from doing the right thing with respect to George Floyd. Julia, there are going to be other experts, right? I remember hearing about experts from the LAPD and other places who are gonna come into this courtroom for prosecutors. Yes, there are use of force experts who are coming from different jurisdictions, different states, and that's on both sides, the state and defense. So this is not technically one of the paid experts who's coming in to speak at the level we're at with witnesses right now. They're talking about the people who reviewed George Floyd's death at the local level where we're at now, but we expect on the state level and the FBI that those witnesses will be coming in in the coming days. All right, Julie Janae, uh, we will speak again uh, shortly. Uh, the judges will stay where they are. And when we come back, devastating evidence all week long. But, but don't forget, prosecutors have the burden to prove each element of the crime beyond any and all reasonable doubt. That's how you get a conviction. So for second degree murder, you've got to prove a third degree assault because second degree murder is kind of like felony murder. So I have a big question tonight for the two judges when we come back. Where's the intent? We'll talk about it when we come back.